Okay, wonderful. So I'm gonna go ahead and so first, this is this is the overview of this uh, of this uh, session. So we I'm gonna start with the story. Then we're gonna describe the problem overall of uh, addiction and overdoses in Tennessee. Uh, then we're gonna describe a little bit the grant that we that we're that we're working on, the high impact areas program, the activities, and then the most important part probably of this session is gonna be a panel that my colleague Shannon DePont is gonna be leading with three of our coordinators that are actually implementing this program. And then we're, we're going to have a space for like comments and, and questions. And let me, let me start with the story. I think it's really easy to lose perspective sometimes and why are we doing this? Uh, and so let me tell a story. Anthony grew up in a city uh, of Rowley Logger in Southeast Tennessee. His blue collar family struggles financially every day to survive, while his father suffers from alcoholism and his mom from chronic depression. To build the family income, Anthony drops out with, of the high school and starts working in a construction company where one day he has an accident and ends up hospitalized. The doctor sent him home with a 30 day prescription of oxycodone. The first day that he tried the pills, Anthony describes it as the happiest day of his life. In a few moments, he has an addiction problem and most of his income goes toward buying the pills. Soon he starts using heroin and barely can keep up with his work. He's soon an employee and out of his small, small, small apartment. One Saturday night, EMS receives a call by a bystander who found a homeless person unconscious and barely breathing in a Walmart parking lot. After his work-related accident, the second time that Anthony has a contact with the health system, it was to revive him with two shots of naloxone. After uh, EMS leaves, after the like applying the naloxone, Anthony doesn't want to go to the hospital and he's left to his own devices again, who in a second, in a second drug overdose that week, Anthony dies. And this is, this is since I started working, and in Tennessee, this is a story that is way too common. And I think that when we think in numbers and in statistics and why are we doing this, I think we should have, we should keep in mind people like Anthony. And I'm sure that we all know or have been in contact with somebody like Anthony. And this is, this is the, the engine behind, uh, behind what, we, what we do every day. So now, what is going on in Tennessee in terms of the statistics? So what we know is that from 2020, uh, 2019 to 2020, we saw an increase of 40.9% in drug overdoses in the state. Overall, in the United States, that was 26%. So if we like uh, put all these states in order, in the in order, we will figure out that Tennessee is actually the seventh state in the country with the largest uh, percentage increase in, in overdoses from 2019 to 2020. So this is something that definitely we shouldn't be proud about. And if we see Tennessee overall, this trend every year, we beat ourselves in terms of increasing uh, overdoses in the state. And we see 2018 to 2019, the increase was around 15%. And if we compare with 2020, that increase was around 30%, 37%. So these numbers are just going up and up and up. So, there was um, Einstein say that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that we use it when we create them. And this is very true. So we talk about addiction for the past 30, 40 years, we have followed the medical model. And I'm a physician myself. And I know that when you have a patient, you start thinking in terms of organs. And then you say, okay, this organ, the brain is malfunctioning. So we have to fix that organ with a medication. And then we have to do X and we have to provide these tests and like, follow up. But this model, it neglects a very important aspect of the patient's life and that's the environment. So two very famous experiments that I'd like to talk about. Uh, in 1981, a doctor, Bruce Alexander, a psychologist from uh, Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, created an experiment and he called it Rat Park. And Rat Park, he divided a bunch of rats in his lab in two groups. One group, he put water with morphine and, and normal water, and he put the rats in a small cage isolated. And the other, the other group of rats, 
they put them in a very fun space, like every big space where the rats can actually play with each other. And then he put again the same dispensers, water and water with morphine. And then he measured what group of rats consume most, more water with morphine. So he discovered that rats that were caged consume 20 times more morphine with water compared with other rats. And, and that was the first experiment that it tells a little bit about the nature of addiction. Now, let's go back to the Vietnam War. This is the 60s, early 70s, the United States is fighting against Vietnam. And most of the soldiers in Vietnam at that, at that moment, like 20% of them, fulfill criteria for drug addiction. They used to, they use a lot of heroin, a lot of methamphetamines, um, and this is all reported. This is, this is nothing that we don't know about. So, and they were in a very harsh conditions in a war, you can imagine. When they go back to the United States, fewer than 1% of these soldiers that use drugs became opioid addicts. So these, what these experiments tell us is about, about the nature of addiction is that the addiction is not about the substance itself, but about the needs of the person. It's about the environment of the person. Um, so this is how, and this is all important context because I'm gonna explain a little bit more about the program and how we're working to, to, to address this. So now there, there is a very famous uh, US psychologist, George Engel, who, who, said, who started a very interesting treatment model for addiction thinking and this idea that environment is responsible for addiction. Um, so while many other therapists were devoted to treating one particular aspect of the person's mental struggles, he came with this idea called the biopsychosocial approach. And basically what he was saying is addiction happens at the intersection of biology, psychology, and social determinants. So, and what we have discovered time and time again is that around 90% of the cases of addiction are related with social causes. So what are those social causes? Are these factors that people have? Protective factors against addiction, caregiver involvement and monitoring. This is why it's so important that, she, that the, the most important period in the life of a person for, for preventing addiction is actually the first 1000 days of life. And this is about attachment. And then is health and neurological development, coping skills, something that we have to, that, that we work in resilience training for, for kids, sick, uh, physical safety, uh, safe neighborhoods, quality school, and, uh, quality school environment. What are the risk factors that promote addiction? All the opposite, trauma and childhood adversity. Around 90% of the people with addiction has like some childhood trauma that never was addressed. Mental health problems, poverty, uh, drug availability, negative school climate, sensation seeking. And what we have seen is that one person who has a first degree relative that has an addiction problem is four times more, more likely that, that he will be also, that he will have an addiction problem. So this is just a taste of like social determinants and why it's so important to address addiction in a comprehensive way. Now, let's jump to the grant that created uh, our program. It's a grant from the Center of Disease Control and Prevention from the CDC is managed by the Opioid Response Coordination Office. It's a four year cycle. It was initially three years, now it's four years. And it's very interestingly, this grant has two priorities. One, data informed action. It's no ideology, it's no uh, something that I believe, it's data and evidence. So we're trying to push their evidence-based approaches. Second, develop local capacity in the Department of Health. This is probably the most comprehensive program in the history of Tennessee in, in terms of creating capacity in local departments of health so that they start uh, implementing their own actions. And this is why in this, in this session, we have actually the, the panelists are coordinators implementing the program. And these are newly uh, persons hired in the local departments to address addiction. Now, what are we working in this program? And then I'm gonna tell you what are the specific uh, areas where we, an activity that we have. So we are working in all the counties when, uh, in most of the counties where like overdoses exceed the statewide average in 2008. And this is how the first thing of the program it was to decide where are we gonna work? And this is the first thing where we use data to decide where we're gonna work. And we go working in Shelby, in Montgomery, Sheehan, uh, Davidson and Rutherford, in East Tennessee, and also in uh, Southeast Tennessee and Northeast Tennessee. Now, what are the activities 
And thinking about the nature of addiction has a multifactorial uh, result and social, biological, and psychological result, we, the, the high impact areas program has multiple activities at different levels. So first we have substance use multidisciplinary task forces. And this is, this is, these are, is operating this, this projects and across the, the different locations where we have the high impact areas program. We have acute, acute overdose outbreak response plan. And this also working uh, in all the different locations. Um, we have prevention activities, navigation for patients with substance use disorder, emergency department discharge protocols, syringe services program expansion, medications for opioid use disorder in a correctional facility. Actually, this program is the first one in the state. And we're pushing, pushing hard to make sure that this program actually bring benefits to patients and we measure the outcomes of this program. And then we have also a pre-trial diversion program in Northeast. And actually the panelists that we have uh, in this session, we'll, they're gonna be talking about specific projects that they're working on. Now, going back to the nature of addiction and how complicated it is to uh, deal and to tackle with addiction, if we deal with this in, very, in a very, like Anthony, let's go back to Anthony. Anthony has two, different uh, contacts with the health system. One, to get him in medication and opioids, and the second one, to revive him when he, got the, when he had the overdose. In between or before, he never had all the contacts with the health system, really. So when we think about, about opioid use disorder and the high impact areas program, we talk about, we think about this scale delivery value chain, which means we're not in the business of treating a disease. We're in the business of treating a patient and that patient can be, there are multiple contacts with this patient that we can have to make sure that this person has the best outcome possible. So in terms of promotion, we have drug prevention campaigns. In terms of prevention, we have implemented targeted child resilience trainings. Um, in terms of early diagnosis, we have implementing opioid use disorder screening in high risk populations, including in correctional facilities. In early treatment, we have referring patients with screen positive for opioid use disorder to the appropriate services in health clinics and also in, in some hospitals. Follow up, of course, we're expanding patient navigation programs and we're working very closely with the mental health department to, to expand one of the programs that they have in, in navigation program. Management of complications, we have this program to develop and implement overdose outbreak response protocols and expand SSPs Care at the end of life, this is something that is part of the care delivery value chain, but we actually, we don't have a program in this, but it will be about palliative medicine and dignified care at the end of life. So this is very, this is big picture. What is the high impact areas program? What do we stand for? How we understand the context and how we understand uh, addiction as a problem and how we're trying to address addiction in the state for multiple different aspects.